Welcome back. I'm Graham Richardson. We're going to talk about COVID in just a second. We'll talk about it now. Somebody, uh, Mike and Barhaven, asking the mistakes that I mentioned. I talked about my family and sort of the calls that I was making about the pandemic. Um, and what I was referring to, Mike, was that after the first lockdown, my view was politically, it would be very, very difficult for them to do it again and again and again. Uh, not making a judgment on whether they should have or shouldn't have. And I kept telling my boys, look, once they get through this, um, the, the, the public just won't stand for another lockdown like this, regardless of the benefits um, to society. And I was, I was flat out wrong. They kept locking down. And I know all of the things that flowed from that and why they did it. And I'm not throwing, you know, shade on them for doing it, but I just, I got it wrong. Um, 56-year-old patient at Toronto Sunnybrook Hospital became patient zero, the first COVID-19 case in Canada, four years on. Mask and vaccines are optional now. The virus, though, is still with us. Raywat Dianandin, epidemiologist and science communicator at the University of Ottawa and someone who uh, was a regular here and remains a regular. Uh, Raywat, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. When you um, look back at those early days, um, you often cautioned us that we don't know a lot. And... We, we certainly didn't. And I think a lot of the debate now, looking back, is a hindsight debate, what we should have done and shouldn't have done and where we got it wrong. Is that fair? It's fair that we have to do a post-mortem on our decision-making process, but we have to be forgiving towards ourselves as well. We didn't know a lot, and so you make decisions based upon the precautionary principle, which often means you overstep in the direction of increased control, mm. and that annoys a lot of people in the civil liberties camp. So this, this division in society was a little bit to be expected. The depth of it, however, has been troubling. How so? Well, uh, uh, pandemics have a history of exacerbating the divides in society. Historically, it's been socioeconomic, but this one has divided us ideologically. There's strong divisions among political camps, and uh, certain you know, um, dishonest brokers have deepened that divide even further, pushed by foreign disinformation merchants. Um, uh, distrust in vaccines, distrust in public health, distrust in all authority figures, that's been made worse by all of this. And that's unfortunate, and I don't really know how we get out of it. Yeah. And sometimes I think, looking back, I think on both, on both sides, um, well, I'll just say it. I mean, I think that uh, there is something to the prime minister's choice of words when he talked about those who chose not to get vaccinated. And I'm wondering whether he may never say it, but I'm wondering whether he has regrets about some of the tone he set on that piece. I'm not suggesting overall that's a massive part of it. And I know others say it is. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But I'm wondering about that, about that sort of us and them. And did he add to it or did he, did he deflate that division? And it's an interesting question. It is. I don't think I have an answer for it, except to no. say I regret some of my own verbiage. I think I probably added to it a bit in my original eagerness to compel people to vaccinate more. Uh, in the long run, it probably pushed some people away. It's The history of public health communication is fraught with um, uh, trial and error, uh, and different emergencies require different approaches. And it was unclear how long the vaccine push would have to last. We thought about last weeks or months, not years. Yeah. And had we known it was going to last years, uh, a softer tone might have been more appropriate. But here we are. Um, and, and we should point out, in terms of, in terms of the death rate in Canada... And a lot of the metrics, Canada did very well. Fair? Yeah, compared to places like the USA. Look, um, our death rate is about 0.15% um, of our overall population. The USA was 0.3%. So we're like, you know, we're half of that and mm -hmm. with similar, similar structures. We're not as good as places like Bhutan you know, or Vietnam right, right. did extraordinarily well. So it depends on what your metric is. However, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that I'm, I'm relatively proud of our leaders, at least in those first couple of years. Um, later on, we kind of lost our eye on the ball. Yeah. And, and, and again, without pointing fingers, later on, um, where, what were the big mistakes later on from your view? Um, is pretending it was over when it wasn't over. 
right. and not using the time we bought constructively. You were commenting earlier about the lockdowns being overly long, and I agree that they shouldn't have been that long because the lockdowns were meant to buy time to build infrastructure, and we didn't build that infrastructure. We should have improved ventilation in schools, for example. We should have really worked harder at getting mm. the vaccine uptake infrastructure up and built. It was a, a lost opportunity for public health expense and um, uh, broadening, not tightening. Mm. It also exposed one of the moments that I'll never forget um, is I was talking to Alex Munter and I, I was looking at some European data and, you know, uh, I said our infection rate is better than Germany's or something like that. And I mentioned Germany and he immediately said, but, but they have triple the beds we have. So yeah. their infection rate matters much less than ours does. And I had not looked at that before and the availability of beds and hospitalization, you know, was stark. Like it, it started to, you know, like lots of questions now about the healthcare system during the pandemic. It's like, wait a second, we can't handle something like this at all. It seems we are just not prepared. Absolutely true. And we've had this problem for about 30 years now when our bed capacity started diminishing and was not being replenished. So in the OECD countries, we rank near the bottom of those with bed margins. Absolutely. So this is something that needs to be fixed immediately. So the investment needs to be made now so that when the next emergency happens, as it will, we are not cut uh, as unguarded. Yeah. And for governments, they've got packed emergency rooms. They don't have enough family doctors. They have increasing costs for cancer treatments. And they would say, a minister of health would say, I have to do all of these things at once. And so that's the problem, that you can't, you can't build capacity for the next pandemic and do all those other things um, under our current system. It's just impossible. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm savvy to that, but it's all kind of linked together. You build capacity for the next pandemic by fixing the healthcare system now by getting the HR back in action, by uh, uh, having more preventative measures, by having more urgent care centers, by investing in prevention, we save money downstream by having not to spend money on acute care. So this is a cost-saving measure if you spend the money now rather than later. Yeah. Um, what do you think has changed most? Well, Maybe not even necessarily medical or healthcare. Right. What, what do you think has changed most for this country it's social and it's not just this country it's across most of the world in particular the western world there's a lot more um naked aggression of the uncomfortable type i mean there are news reports now of greater rcmp expenditures to protect mps because they're under threat all the time journalists were under a lot of threat uh, public health people like myself under threat all the time and that hasn't really gone away so the amount of social division is greater now than before and the amount of freedom people feel uh, in making naked threats to their fellow citizens is distressingly high. Mm. So it's the depth of divisions ideologically in society that is the truly troubling and longer lasting impact of this pandemic. And it's something we as a society have to fix. Not scientists, not medical professionals, not leaders necessarily. Society must fix this. Do you think that that is like historically pandemics exacerbating divisions? Do you think that will uh, go away in time? It's just another part of a pandemic adjustment or is this one yeah. different? Well, I don't know, um, mm -hmm. but I think it will go away in time. I have to be hopeful. Everything historically goes away eventually replaced by something else, something worse or something better. But we're in a time of change. There's political change, there's social change, there's scientific change, there's demographic change. Change comes with its stresses. And this is just one manifestation of that stress. We will work this through. It may take uh, decades. Hopefully it takes months, not decades. Mm. But it does require some focus on the part of each of us and our leaders. Rewat Dianandin, always great to talk to you. Thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thank you. All right.